I'd like to um, welcome you again. Uh, this is my husband, Tom, over there in the, the corner. He's been very helpful with everything we've done today. I think many of you have already talked to him about the th things that we've brought. Um, unfortunately, these are not rocks that are full of gold, but um, I wanted to show you these. They do have little flakes of mica that are very small and um, typical of the kind of gold you might find if you were luckier than I am. So that's why I brought those rocks, because they're, the gold in this area was, was really found in the form of gravel, not nice big chunks, right? And many of you know more about um, finding gold than I do, and I'm really not going to talk about gold per se. So if you're very disappointed, the only gold I brought is in chocolate. So, um, what I'm interested in more than the geology and more than the coins and more than the mint is the stories that people have told about what happened here, what life was like during the North Carolina Gold Rush. And I will show the documentary that UNC Television made in 2012. And that does focus on the Becklers and on the mint and on the impact on the economy of what Beckler did here. But, but I'm really going to focus on before Beckler. Um, I'm going to introduce you to two men. One of them has written a book that I brought with me. His name is George Fanshawe, and it's spelled Featherstone Haw. He was an English geologist, and he came through Rutherford County in 1837. And bless his heart, he kept a journal. And his is the most complete description we have of what life was like in the foothills during the gold rush. And I'm going to read you quite a long excerpt from that book, unless there's anyone here from England. Is there anyone here from England? I would love to have someone read this as it should be read. The other person I'm going to introduce you to is Roswell Elmer, Jr. And Roswell Elmer Jr. was a very young man. He was a printer in Charlottesville, Virginia, and he caught gold fever. And he went to North Carolina. And bless his heart, he kept a journal too. And that journal is in the collection at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. It's very difficult to read, it's all handwritten. Um, sometimes he was writing in the stagecoaches as he moved from town to town. But it is a different perspective. It's a very personal perspective from a young man who thought, I will seek my fortune in the gold fields. And his realization over the next several weeks that it wasn't going to be quite that easy. And so I'm going to read you another excerpt from that. I'm sorry to have to read you this, but no one else has told you these things. Um, and so I think these people really deserve um, credit for having recorded their experiences here. Um, I've also um, put out on the table, and perhaps some of you saw reprints from a few pages from the newspaper that was published here in the 1830s. They are a wonderful source of color for the details of what life was like in, uh, in Rutherford County at the time. So that's about what I want to say before I show you a few slides, if we can, I think this, yes, this is on. This is, drawing is actually, am I in your way? You can see. Um, drawing is from a cover of a book called Gold in North Carolina, but I colored it. I thought it was more fun than the edge. For those of you, who's not from Polk County? Did people move here from somewhere else? Most of us. Um, what is now Polk County is, is right down here in this area. In the 1830s, Rutherford County included what is now Cleveland, Henderson, part of McDowell, all of Polk, and a little bit of Buncombe. And then over the next, between 1830 and 1850, they created a great many more counties as more people came into the area. And I just thought it would be good to locate you in space and time. So when I say Rutherford, 
that included this area at that time. Um, and I was looking, there's a map in the back of the room, which is the first map made of Polk County. And there are three gold mines that show on that map. Yeah, Mary's pointing to it. It's up there in the corner. Take a look. I don't think my pointer goes that far, but <laughs> down in the southern part of it, there are three um, gold mines shown there. I've circled on this map again to orient you. The big blue circle is Rutherfordton. It's the only town of any significance in Rutherford. The little blue circle is around Walnut Creek. Uh, the course of Walnut Creek has been mapped more accurately since this map was made. This is an 1808 map. But Walnut Creek, which runs, Babs, where are you? Yep. It runs right back down here. Two and a half miles. So we're on the map here as early as 1808. Travel was very difficult in um, the 19th century. Um, it took, this is one of the ads that I've recreated out of the newspaper. It took three and a half days to get from Winston-Salem, North Carolina, which was Salem in those days, to Greenville, South Carolina. Three and a half days. Only cost you five cents a mile, but it, um, the Tate's Hotel was in Morganton. Oh, I have to go back to this ad. If you've seen the Viking River Cruise ads on PBS, this just said, the stage line passes through a romantic and healthy country, yielding all the bounties of nature. It passes through the bosom of the gold region of Western North Carolina. Doesn't that sound like a Viking cruise? <laughs> Whoops, yeah, did I skip that? Okay, North Carolina Gold Rush, 1799. Children in the Reed children were playing in Little Meadow Creek and they found a 17 pound gold nugget. Um, it took dad four years before he went to find out what that was and what it was worth. But once he discovered what it was worth, he began to look for more. Uh, and then when people found out that John Reed was finding gold, everybody began to look for gold in North Carolina. So although the discovery was 1799, really the gold rush did not begin until the 19th century in North Carolina. By the 19, 1820s, um, the North Carolina General Assembly decided they should really get serious about finding out where the gold was and who was looking for it. So they sent out surveyors during the summers of 1824, 25, and 26. One of them was Elisha Mitchell, for whom Mount Mitchell is named. Um, and he was one of the, he was professor at um, UNC. And one of his um, companions on the survey team was Charles Rota, who was a German um, metallurgist and mining engineer from Saxony. And the, Sa the government of Saxony had sent him to North Carolina to find out about the gold. And if you can see on here, um, I've blown our, our region. The gold mines of these little red dots, north of Rutherfordton and then south of um, really the White Oak Creek. And again, that's where they show up on this 1840s map of um, Polk County. So there, the mining out here was not the deep vein mining. Some of you may have been to the Reed Gold Mine where they went in underground, following gold in the veins through the rocks. Here it was found in stream gravels, mostly in very small flakes. Sometimes you got lucky, you found a nugget, but mostly it was found as flakes. And everyone had their variations on the devices for separating the gold from the gravel. That was the big issue. Is, are you finding tiny little flakes 
but you have to go through an awful lot of sand and gravel to find the tiny little flakes. So everybody had a new device for doing this. And this is one of my favorite um, items out of the newspapers. They were filing patent notices. I have built a better rocker. I have a new cradle. I have a system. And they were all filing patent notices and saying, I forbid anyone to use my design. I have patented it. And so it was a real flowering of invention here that people were involved in this. Oh, the reason I had, whoops, can I go back? Yeah. Notice this one in particular up at the top where they fasten two troughs together. That is so one person can rock several different troughs. You put the gravel in there and this also appeals to me because that's a woman. And she's working here and up here we have a young girl. So it was news to me that they had women and girls working in the gold fields. Um, it looks like a miserable job. Um, I can feel my hips hurt just looking at the picture. Um, but it was a much more efficient way to um, process a good deal of gold than the individual rocker. This is my friend Fanshawe. Never mind how it's spelled. Pronounce it Fanshawe. And he says, and I, this is where I'm, I'm going to read you this. I'm sorry. I, he wrote to Jamestown, it's all topsy-turvy by the gold diggers who had utterly ruined these beautiful valleys. Continuing from there, I reached the beautiful situation where Major Forney had established himself and where he had made another desolation. His buildings were situated on a knoll in a lovely valley surrounded with lofty hills, which was defaced in every direction with piles of washed earth and gravel eight and 10 feet high, the labor being performed by both white and black men. The first, the white men, 50 cents per day. They were natives of this mountainous country and were altogether illiterate, not knowing even their letters. Their children received no education whatever. I looked into many of their huts, and it would be difficult to find anything more rude and dirty. It was not an uncommon thing to find a woman big with child suckling an infant in her arms and screaming to a set of brats crawling about like kittens in every corner of a room without either windows or doors. And thus they crawl through life without either religious or moral instruction. Yet upon inquiring of them, they all seemed to prefer their mountain life with all its disadvantages. I wish this were being read with an English accent. The country was singularly beautiful, perfectly healthy, and I thought it one of the most promising places I had seen. Many of these places were certainly very productive, but all their owners appeared to be embarrassed in their financial circumstances. They come here without capital, buy a place on credit, apply their profits to the purchase of slaves and to the unavoidable expenses of the management of their undertakings. They endeavor to monopolize every new place that promises to be productive, purchasing them at the most extravagant prices on credit so that the profits they obtain are insufficient to keep down their debts and they are harassed to death by their creditors. They believe themselves to be in possession of unbounded wealth at the moment when everyone acquainted with their affairs believes them insolvent. If an opportunity presents itself of selling any part of their property, they feel as if they were parting with a mountain of gold and ask 20 times more than the property is worth, and so never sell it at all, but drag on a hurried and painful existence the slaves of their creditors till they are forced to a general liquidation and lose everything. This I found to be pretty much the history of all the large undertakers in gold mining who enter upon it without capital. And that's a crucial piece of information. But this picture of the desolation around here, and if you've driven up Highway 221, 
past the Thermal City Gold Mine, you will see that there are hillsides up along the Second Broad River that have still not recovered from the loss of topsoil. Um, there were one or two, he mentions uh, Major Forney, who was one of the few mine owners who set aside the topsoil, dug his trenches, and then replaced the topsoil. But for the most part, they just buried it, burrowed into it, and um, without um, um, worry. This is newspaper advertisements for people who are offering um, to sell this particular mine, the Triangle Gold Mine, on the waters of the North Pakalat, just down the road from us. Uh, persons disposed to pursue mining had better attend and enrich themselves. Don't you love these ads? Um, and this one, we're getting an ad placed by an agent in New York City. He has investors who would like to participate in the speculation in gold and become partners or shares in gold mines or gold mining companies. Uh, Rutherford was known throughout the East as a place where gold mining was a, um, a, a frequently successful enterprise. One of the families that was engaged in gold mining was the Carson family. Some of you have probably been to the Green River Plantation, which is the, one of the homes of the Carson family um, on the Green River, now in Polk County at the time in um, Rutherford County. The Carson house of the father, John Carson, is in Marion, just outside Marion. This was a family that had sufficient capital, land, and slaves to engage in gold mining. And they did that very successfully, and they did it for well into the 1840s after, and in 50s, after gold had been discovered in California, uh, when many of the North Carolina mines closed. Um, the Carson family had the same problem as everyone else, getting their gold to market. But being the Carson family, they had their younger son elected to Congress so he could submit a bill to establish a mint in the South so that you wouldn't have to ship your gold to Philadelphia. Well, Samuel Price Carson introduced this bill at least three different occasions. It never got out of committee. But he proposed that they um, establish a, an assay office and a mint in the South because it was such a challenge to get your gold to Philadelphia. Um, he never succeeded. So this is where I'm going to end that particular part, was with the frustration that the miners had with the um, lack of market. And I'm going to go back to the two men I told. In 1829, in the fall, Roswell Elmer Jr. starts his trip from Charlottesville, Virginia, to North Carolina to pursue his dream of mining. At the same time, almost exactly the same time, Christopher Beckler left his home in Sforzheim and um, sailed first to New York, and then he quickly went to Philadelphia, where he applied for citizenship. And uh, I, I just think that these two men, both coming from different directions, were drawn to Rutherford County because of the gold. And neither one ended up doing what they thought they would do. Christopher Beckler is 48 years old. He was a successful jeweler, a clockmaker, a gunsmith. And he's described in legal documents as a factory owner. His family business was making jewelry. I put on the table there a book uh, about Swartzheim. Beckler had attended the Technical Academy for jewelry and clock making was known throughout Europe as the source of fine um, watches and clocks. When he left, he put an ad in the German newspaper saying he was selling his office building on the marketplace. He sold his carriage and his horses. 
One of the things we have learned since the documentary was made um, from the editor of the newspaper in Svortheim was that Beckler had filed much earlier a patent application for, guess what, a machine for separating gold from gravel. And he got permission from the Grand Duke to test this machine. The, his results were very disappointing. He mined, had mined, 17,000 kilograms of sand and gravel and found a gram of gold, one gram of gold. Well, that's another level of frustration. Plus, it took him six years to get his patent approved by the bureaucratic process. <clears throat> At the same time he was having all this frustration, the discoveries of gold in North Carolina, is it, whoops, where are we are? There. Um, North Carolina gold, right? Is that? Can you read these old um, German for me? <laughs> um, um, the discovery of gold was being widely reported in, in Germany. If you remember, Charles Rota was part of that survey. He was reporting on his findings in both English and in English journals and in um, the German press. So Beckler knew perfectly well that there was gold in North Carolina. September of 1829, he sailed for America with his sons, Augustus and Charles, and with his nephew, who is called Christopher Jr., which is very annoying and very confusing. Um, he arrived in New York City October the 12th. And we found out on the Henry IV, it was a French ship. He went immediately to Philadelphia, where he applied for citizenship. Philadelphia, remember, is the home of the United States Mint. And this is a photograph of the first coin press that was used by the Mint. And at the time, 1829, North Carolina was the major supplier of gold to the Mint. Beckler doubtless knew this. Same time, here comes Roswell Elmer. And I'm going to read you from Roswell Elmer's journal. Um, You have to remember he's very young. He's 20 years old. Um, and he's somewhat dramatic in his presentation of himself. Every entry in his journal begins with the weather and whether he had breakfast. What? I mean, as he goes through his, um, his journal, He's also always interested in whether he meets any girls that day. So it's, it's interesting. Charlottesville, Virginia, August 29th, 1829, Saturday. This morning at 2 o'clock, I was awoke and in furtherance of my plans, took the Richmond stage from George's Tavern in Goochland County, Virginia, thence to take the southern stage for Salisbury, North Carolina. It had been raining every day and rain was falling in torrents. Nothing but my fixed determination in my plans would have forced me out in this confound that I must win or lose and try my venture. Shining dust is scattered o'er the ground. He says that over and over again. Shining dust and you will see that later on. And I go with high hopes of success and happiness that will reward my present pains and sacrifices. I have some misgivings, but I was ever a son of hope, and this it is that now supports me. I must shine at something higher than a journeyman printer, but should I fail, my skill in my own profession will keep me from want and penury. For two weeks, he travels through the, um, and visits gold mines in um, North Carolina. So he stops in around Greensboro, he stops in Statesville, he stops in Lexington, and everywhere he goes he talks to people about their experience with gold mining. And um, he had trouble finding horses to borrow, um, it rained, he was discouraged, and so by September 
13th. This is what he had to say. He'd gotten to Lexington. He was starting out for Lincoln. He said, this morning I repacked my trunks with a determination to quit all idea of gold and take the stage for Columbia. I did not find the gold so plentiful as I had imagined and much more difficult in obtaining it. And I thought I might better follow my own business than expose my health and little money in a business so foreign to all my knowledge and experience. To get in the water half leg deep like the other miners would ill serve my health. And were I to lease, I could not reckon upon any profits but stood in much danger of loss. With one or two exceptions, those who had leased mines were leasing again to the laborers for a portion of the proceeds. And in many cases, these laborers were not making enough gold to pay their board, but were induced to push on by the same spirit of gold fever, which has so excited many others. And then he ends that paragraph, but shining dust is scattered o'er the ground. So he goes back and forth in his journal from day to day. Um, Today I'm discouraged, but I met somebody who got me all fired up again. So, um, young man. Should I fit? Yeah, his, his diary is very hard to read, and it gets worse as it goes on. Uh, by September 27th, I had become sick and tired of looking at gold mines, which, if any good, were taken up. At any rate, I feared to cast the die. So he goes back to plan B. He, will, he is encouraged by people in Rutherfordton to start a newspaper. And one of the conditions is you must get 200 subscribers. So he travels around trying to get subscribers for his newspaper. He ends up in Tate's Hotel in Morganton. Remember the little ad for Tate's Hotel? where people going to the gold fields could visit. Well, he spends the night in Tate's hotel. He was glad to get a shelter and a warm fire for I'd been riding all day in the rain. It's still raining on him. One of them, the stage came in about eight in which were two German passengers. One of them just from Germany who professed to be acquainted with the gold mines of that country and says that he can make a machine for $30 that would wash 300 bushels of grit per day and save it all. This has got to be Christopher Beckler. The man who spoke no German, he spoke no English, he had an interpreter with him from Philadelphia. He's never named. But this is just too many coincidences to be anyone else. This is not a picture of what happened. It's just a picture I found that I thought, that must be what it looked like. Beckler buttonholing everyone saying, I have a machine that will wash gold better than your machine. So Elmer's plan B, he starts a newspaper. If he had not started this newspaper, we would only know just a fraction of what we now know about the gold situation in North Carolina, or in the foothills in particular. One of his editorials says, Gold is disseminated in every stream and rivulet in the county, and they have discovered new mines in the waters of the Pacolet and White Oak Rivers, right down the road from us. He wrote, he never lost his interest in gold. Um, this, he found people saying that um, the pursuit of mining tends to retard the prosperity and moral happiness of people groveling for the metals. But in this area, what are the facts? Well, it serves the interests of farmers. They have a new market. They can get paid for their um, produce. And guess what they're being paid in? Shining dust. Here we are again. Because we have a newspaper, we have Christopher Beckler's ads. When he arrives, in the, comes back in the summer of 1830 and starts a business. Christopher Beckler buys land. He buys a lot of land. Um, the property pictured at the top is where he had his little mint business. 
It's now a county park, Rutherford County Park. It's open. Um, I've put a map in case you want to visit it. Um, we've put some interpretive panels there. He had, um, he, there's a tunnel under this land where Beckler was actually digging for gold as they did further east. Um, when Fanshawe visited Beckler, he didn't think that was going to be very successful. He didn't think much of that the rock was really going to produce gold. Um, but Beckler was finding gold somewhere. Um, the, it, there's now a gate um, on this um, mine, but when you talk to people who grew up in Rutherford County, a great many of them had been in that tunnel. Um, not sure it's related to the people I know, but there's a lot of beer cans in the tunnel. <laughs> Eventually, Congress did see the merit in putting a mint in the South, and they built the Charlotte Mint. They put one in Dahlonega, Georgia. They put one in New Orleans. At that point, Beckler's business fell off, and he moved into town, and he built this house in 1838 in Rutherton. It's open as a museum. Um, there are exhibits there. And um, Beckler's original coin press, which looks amazingly like the coin press in Philadelphia. Um, it's on loan to Rutherford, Rutherford Tun from the American Numismatic Society, which owns him. Um, so that's open the hours. It's Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, limited hours. But we can make arrangements for you to tour this at other times if you get in touch with us. I think that's all I wanted to say with that. Um, we're going to try and show the, the DVD now, right? <laughs>